I would like to thank everybody for coming today. This is our first uh, spring 2019 installment of Meatless Mondays. They are co-hosted by the Sustainability Literacy Center, SLI, and the Office of Sustainability, OLS. Uh, both of which are now part of the Center for Sustainability on the campus, and we're actually all been looking forward to. Uh, so what the OS does is they really utilize student involvement to help bring the campus forward in terms of sustainability, and the SLI really is trying to bring forth the quality enhancement plan, uh, using sustainability literacy as a bridge to 21st century problems. And with that comes great synergies and the ability to think across disciplines and really bring in the ideas of systems thinking. Because one problem affects every other problem. And not one person can solve any of the given problems that we face in the 21st century world. And so, what I'd really like to say, first of all, is thank you for coming. Second of all, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. John Hale. He comes from the University of South Carolina which is actually newly appointed as he used to be here. We are very sad that they stole him from us. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign 2009 in the history of education with a concentration in American history. And his research really focuses a lot on how community involvement, public, local, and oral histories really interact with that documentation of that history as well as best teacher practices and the moving forwards in how we communicate to our students, student teacher activism, et cetera, et cetera. His research has won several awards, some from the Spencer Foundation, some from the National Academy of Education, and we are really excited to have him here today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Hale in Education on the Front Lines, uh, Access, Desegregation, and Equity in the Low Country. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Well, thank you, um, Josh, for the introduction. And then, so impressive because I think he just remembered all of that. And that's I'm truly impressed. I have a bunch of notes that I would have forgotten half that. So thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you to the Office of Sustainability for the, for the invitation to come back to Charleston. It's always a pleasure to be back in Charleston and to visit Charleston. And um, as was correctly noted in the introduction, I recently left. Charleston to move to Columbia to teach at the University of South Carolina and I was after living in Charleston since 2011 and it's funny because as I was telling people last year I was leaving they would say they would ask why are you leaving Charleston and then or rather why are you moving to Columbia and then when I moved up to Columbia I always get asked the question why would you want to leave Charleston so um, it's an interesting question and, and it's one that I don't know if necessarily one always chooses to move to Charleston or necessarily leave it. In some ways I feel feels like I was pushed out or maybe that fate uh, carried me elsewhere. But I think it's interesting it's an interesting question about sustainability and how we look at it because Charleston, I think in its current state, is often unsustainable. I mean driving here on a rainy day you can see that they're asking the question just how long is this going to last and what can we do to sort of sustain what could be very much a sinking peninsula, right? And education, I, I view it in that context of sustainability. If we can understand education and its pitfalls and problems, but also the promises of education, I think we find a solution that affects everybody and that can increase the value of our society um, overall. So I really do appreciate the invitation. Today I'll be talking about an overview of, of education in Charleston uh, what a lot of the problems are, and then what the solutions are today as well. So I think, and also, I mean, I, I am recognized that this is Black History Month, but as a white scholar, I also recognize that it's one thing just to sit here and talk about black history and not to recognize the role of white exploitation and supremacy in that. So I'll be both drawing on this tension that we see in American history, one between oppression and activism, and that ongoing back and forth, you know, contradiction between the two. So I'll begin with education in the Low Country Broad Overview. Is that the first policy in the American South in regard to education was actually to deny education or to exclude education? And we can see this after the develop after the Stoner Rebellion of September 1739, uh, when up to 50 slaves were marching south to 
Spanish Florida. And of course, the rebellion was crushed later that same day. But South Carolina governors and legislators, or rather Carolina legislators, were confused because they knew that slaves knew how to read and write. They could read and interpret the papers to know that if they got down to Florida, that they'd be granted their freedom. And also the banners, they had words, very, you know, ideological words and concepts like freedom and liberty. And they knew that literacy inspired this revolution. And they're exactly right, because we can see the first education policy passed the very next year was to make it illegal or to criminalize the education of Africans and African Americans. So the first education policy in the region is one of exclusion. And we can see this with the Denmark Vesey uprising in 1832, right? We see a literate ex-slave who bought his freedom utilizing literacy and education as a way to inspire resistance or as a way to overthrow an oppressive regime. And education is absolutely critical to this. So white architects of the slave codes pass an additional series of laws that continues to criminalize education. And we see this in laws passed in 18, uh, later right after the rebellion in, in 22, but also in 1832 and 1835, where we see new codes being passed one on top of each other. So it's sort of a layered oppression to deny education of slaves and free slaves in Charleston and the Low Country as well. So when we talk about education as a sort of, um, as an institution that encapsulates the promises and pitfalls of democracy today, we can see this really traced to how South Carolina has this long view of education as for the elite and to be used as a tool to maintain the status quo and to keep an inexpensive labor force as well. But at the same time that we have oppressive education codes, we also have resistance as well. And of course, we don't have to look any further than Frederick Douglass and his, his autobiographies. All three of them talk about this. In his first autobiography, he describes a passage where his master's wife was teaches, teaching him how to read scripture, or how to read the Bible. And Mr. Auld, his master, comes home one day and begins to verbally accost and uh, punish his wife for teaching a young Frederick Douglass how to read the Bible. And immediately in his mind, he equates education with freedom, or literacy with freedom, because why else would education or literacy inspire such wrath by his master? Why would just learning to read the Bible, which is supposed to uplift all, why would that incur such punishment and vengeance by his master? So he learns very early on that education that he calls or literacy is, quote, the path of freedom. And we also see this illustrated in the film um, and book, 12 Years a Slave. It's not just an ideological commitment to education that, that leads one to freedom. It's also the tangible aspects of it as well. Frederick Douglass, in his first attempt to escape, literally wrote his own path to freedom. In the 12 Years a Slave, you can see right, um, Solomon North writing past to lead the plantation, or in this case, writing a letter to friends in the North. Literacy led to, quite literally, freedom. And this was a message that's passed down from generation to generation. And you can see this in the eve of the Emancipation Proclamation. And here's a, a, a famous depiction of that. Slaves gathering around to read or to decipher or asking someone to read for them what the proclamation meant. If you could read the proclamation, you could understand that you were free. And come Reconstruction, you could read these bogus contracts that whites were trying to push off on people of color. So literacy was a means to emancipation. Literacy was a means to freedom. Literacy was a way to improve the entire collective situation. So we can see this embedded in education resistance. It doesn't come as well with education's practice. Pictured here is Robert Smalls, a war hero, um, not a Confederate war hero. Um, he was enslaved by the Confederate Army, stole the USS Planter, CSS Planter, and delivered it across human lines, becomes a war hero, comes back to the low country, elected to South Carolina representatives, in embodying this, this idea of literacy as freedom, 
becomes one of the legislators in South Carolina to write education into the state constitution. So in these United States where it's not protected by our federal constitution or the, the constitution of the United States, all 50 states write this in the law. And in the southern states, in the former confederacy, former slaves wrote education into law. So they are responsible, former slaves, for writing this. And in South Carolina, we can look at the work of Robert Smalls, not to be confused with Robert Scott Smalls, who the building is in after he was I, I can't remember what generation, but a wealthy white banker, of course, Charles has got a hard time, no offense, Charles, naming a building after a former slave, but different altogether, but he is responsible for writing this into law. So we begin to see Robert Smalls and others, Bruce Blanch, others, embodying this literacy for freedom and writing, literally writing this into law after the Civil War and Reconstruction. So where else do we see this education, this resistance embodied in, in Charles? <coughs> You don't have to look any further than in the Avery, then the Avery Knoll Institute, now Avery Research Center for African American Culture and History, an outstanding place. And by the way, Mr. Dan Cohen here today. I don't know when the renovation will be sometime soon, but it's one of the first places I visit when I moved to Charleston. It's an amazing history and an incredible archive. But the Avery Norman Institute established in 1865, the current building, building erected in 1868 embodies this very notion of educational resistance. That Avery, founded by a private means, would be a way to secure the education and the promise of literacy for people of color and free slaves in Charleston and the Low Country. It still exists today, it still embodies this of history. You can also see this in uh, Burke, Burke High School. Long story short, it's a different model. It's also a public model of education for former slaves and the next generation of those born into freedom, but it embodies and established by Reverend uh, John Dart. His papers are at Avery's, an amazing collection that really documents the history of one of the oldest public schools, black public schools in the Southeast. But what this is, is an embodiment of what education means to people of color in, in the South, but also the United States. And Charleston is an amazing city that sort of documents this history. As much as we have Cal Calhoun and the Confederate flag flying around Charleston, we also have these monuments to resistance, which are embodied in the schools. So it is a long history to demonstrate clearly and once again that education is, it always was, and it always will be sites of political resistance. And we can see this through an African-American perspective that education has and will always be a site of resistance. Both, again, as a means to freedom, but also a tool of white architects of oppression to maintain a status quo or to maintain an inex inexpensive or cheap labor force. So anywhere you cut it, schools, particularly K-12 schools, are sites of political so once schools are established after Reconstruction, we can begin to see a larger infrastructure of resistance. A larger infrastructure of resistance. And for the very rare records that exist of black teachers in southern schools, particularly before the Second World War, and again, Avery has an amazing collection. I'll recommend you to check out the collection of Lois Sims, pictured here in 1941. She's a valedictorian of Avery. She goes on to study at Howard uh, University, majors in education, comes back to teach in Charleston. And Mrs. Sims, I, I had the great opportunity the first year I moved to Charleston to actually interview her in, in the house where she was born in the Morris Street. And is that house still standing? I think, is Mrs. Sims' house still standing? I'm joking, good thing. Uh, an incredible experience. But she would never identify herself as an activist. Right? So I hesitate to use those terms to describe her because she never used them herself. But at the same time, if you look at the work she conducted as a teacher, you can see that she adopted a very critical stance toward white supremacy in the South 
and she also adopted very critical views of what it meant to be a critical progressive educator in Charleston during the era of Jim Crow. So for instance, she was a member of the Palmetto Education Association, which was the all black teachers association. This was a collective association, not a union, but to demand higher wages when the NAACP would take on these court cases in the 1940s. She was interested in black-only teaching initiatives. She was assigning um, authors of the Harlem Renaissance. She was assigning Frederick Douglass. Later on in the late 1960s, she's teaching about the black power movement as the black power movement is unfolding across America. You can see through her curriculum, which is carefully cataloged and available at Avery, her curriculum. We see histories about, um, or we see African American history, a plethora of African American histories in her collection. So we get a good snapshot into what she was teaching. And it was black history in a black school, which may not sound significant now, but for decades, white people have been telling themselves that we don't teach African American history in schools, we don't teach African American culture, we don't teach black literature. But if you follow the curriculum of black teachers who have since been displaced, right, we see that that is in fact what they were teaching in segregated black schools. And here's her thesis that she uh, writes while at Howard, and it's called The Comparative Study for Visions for the Education of Negro and White Peoples in the Public Schools of South Carolina. What does that mean? In the 1940s, before the Supreme Court renders its decision that these southern states better upholding separate but equal before they tear down uh, that edict and, and move towards desegregation, is she is studying the disparities, the economic, disparities in black schools across the South. And she's studying this very well. So she's going to, you know what Tiny Easy Coast and others will call uh, the mecca of black education, Howard, right? And she's studying this problem of unequal education in the 1940s. And she's bringing this knowledge back to the South. This is going to inform a very critical, progressive classroom. By no means am I suggesting that the era of segregation was, you should look at this nostalgic and say, oh, let's go back to that time. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is there's a history of black education and black teachers who are quite critical in how they teach in Southern classrooms. A really good book on this, uh, Vanessa Siddle Walker just published Education of Howard Tate, who's looking at Georgia State Teachers Association. A really good article on her in The Atlantic about it, but we're beginning to sort of revise this history to look at teachers as political actors, but to look at black women uh, who led the charge for progressive critical education in the South. And Mrs. Lois Sims is just one of the many black teachers who, who sort of led this struggle for educational justice. Hard to see, but students, right? I like to, I, writing a book on the history of high school student activism, it's hard to really describe these students as activists. They weren't always marching, they weren't tearing down monuments, they weren't, you know, sitting in on a president's office who hangs a Confederate flag asking for his removal. It was a little more nuanced, it was a little more subtle, but when you can begin to see critical discourse among students by reading through the pages of the Parvin, which is Avery's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Burke's high school student newspaper. So first of all, high school student newspapers are very hard to come by. Avery has an outstanding collection of the Parvenu Burke's high school. I know this is more of a talk about the great collection of Avery. Maybe I'll give an honorarium for trying to look down so much. But what it is is really an excellent collection of black high school student newspapers. And when you read through the pages of the Parvenu, you can see quite critical discourse about what it means to be a good citizen in the United States what it means to be a citizen during the era of segregation. These are questions about citizenship and democracy and what education means to that, that students are publishing in their own words, again, in the 1940s and 50s. We also begin to see the records in Charleston and the low country, but across the South, of the NAACP Youth Councils. Tom, Thomas Bynum has a really good book called NAACP and the Fight for Freedom where he looks at the history of the youth councils, but you can also see the history of the, I'm beginning to say now the real SNCC, Southern Negro Youth Congress, no offense to Judy Richardson and the others, but 
the work of Southern civil rights organizations were specifically organizing black youth. Not black youth in college, African American youth in middle schools and high schools to petition their legislators, to raise issues of an unequal curriculum, to raise issues of unequal funding in American public schools. So what we really begin to see here, again, is an infrastructure of resistance throughout the American South. And here, uh, these are digitized, right, so you can find these online, but The Crisis is publishing a series of youth, uh, and Rebecca Deschwines writes about this uh, as well, but specifically targeting young people, which I find to be very significant because now, especially during the Black Lives Matter movement, and we can begin to see the criminalization of what it means to be black, right? or when you look at the criminalization of black youth, the NAACP had been fighting this in earnest since their founding in, 19, uh, in the early 1900s, uh, 1909, but then also looking at you know, Charleston in 1917. They're really taking on the issue of the criminalization of black youth. And when you go through the pages of the crisis, you can see that the NAACP was, NAACP was using, using youth councils to combat these negative stereotypes of black adolescents, but also using the crisis as a way to um, make the argument that black youth matter, that black youth matter just as much as white youth. And you can see the pages of the crisis as really this venue to sort of make this argument. So again, we have this infrastructure of activism. It's hard to call it activism as we know it today. But at the same time, we see this critical foundation of this place. Again, Avery here in Charleston, the whole country, is the site in 1944. John Wrighton, a returning war veteran, goes to, finishes his high school education at Avery, applies to the College of Amen. Charleston, right? Don't forget, it's a segregated all-white college in the 1940s. They're all denied, but offered scholarships to SC State. College of Charleston, that you send essentially privatizes, but it becomes a private institution in order to avoid applications from black students, right? But what starts this? Black students from Avery who are taking classes from teachers who are trained in a northern critical context who want to raise awareness about segregation and what it means to be a citizen in a segregated democracy in the 1940s. And Avery, right down the road on Bull Street, really encapsulates this history about a critical form of resistance that's happening in Charles. And again, here's Southern Negro Youth Congress, one of the major uh, civil rights organizations specifically in the South. If you go to the next slide. Actually, one of the most significant, uh, uh, one of the most significant conferences of the uh, Southern Negro Youth Congress takes place in the beautiful capital city of Columbia. Keynote address called Behold the Land, given by uh, Dr. W.B. Du Bois, specifically calling on black youth to take part in a new civil rights movement. It's what Reverend James Blake calls, and it's really hard to see, the rise of a new kind of black youth. Reverend James Blake, pictured here is the NAACP on the eve of getting uh, arrested at, this, at the crest at the Crest Senate, right, uh, 1960, which is just down at the corner of uh, King and Wentworth. Let's look forward one more slide. Um, so again, what does this lead to? Uh, before I get to a conclude, some concluding points, Charleston in the low country is the, is the South, if not the entire United States of education as resistance, as a movement for educational justice, which is an important platform for the larger civil rights movement. In Charleston, we have the Briggs v. Elliott decision, which is one of the five court cases that um, becomes the Brown v. Board of Education, argued here in the city of Charleston. This picture here was um, printed by Jonathan Green, given to Judge Richard Gergel, which is now framed in his office. And for a larger, really helpful history of this, Richard, Judge Richard Gurdle just published his book, Unexampled Courage, which is profiled in the New York Times. Uh, you should check it out. It talks about this detail in much, um, it talks about this history in much more detail. Now, what can we take from this? 
we look at this history and we look at what's left, what's literally what's left of public schools, what can we do with this today? So I'd like to conclude by looking at four points that are grounded in this history, and that as we reflect on this history in Black History Month, but also in the midst of a Red for Ed movement, teachers going on strike, and this today Denver's, this week Denver is on strike, this is on the heels of Los Angeles going on, teachers going on strike, which is on the heels of an entire movement, which begins in right, right to work states. Four major points. One is after the Brown decision, we see public education reconstructed to its current state. And the first of four sort of pillars of this reconstruction of uh, public education is privatization and divestment of public education. And you see this in Charleston. It's a classic point. What happens here in the whole country happens all across the country. South Carolina passes and passes what proves to be an unconstitutional bill called the Tuition Grants Bill, where the state of South Carolina is subsidizing white families who enroll in a private school. Why? It encourages white families to leave public schools which are being desegregated after the Brown decision. By 1967, across the state of South Carolina, we have 44 state-supported private schools. And across the South, we have close to 400 state-supported private schools, which are part of a larger private school system of nearly 1,500 private schools founded since the 1950s. So these are basically white private schools set up for those who can afford to leave public desegregated the classic example, of course, in Charleston is Port of God that was reestablished in 1964, the year after Charleston desegregated. Bishop England said in 1963 is another school. If you think back to the towns you're from in the South, chances are you're going to see a private segregation academy established sometime between 1951 and 1975. These are segregation academies specifically set up to uh, ignore or resist desegregation. And what do we have today? Especially me coming from the north, and people you're, and people are recruiting you. They don't tell you to go to the local public school. They give you the, the good private schools in the area that a lot of people send their kids to. They've divested from public education. Second major point of reconstructing education after the Brown decision is the suburbanization, if you will, of public education. So it's not as if we don't have really good public schools. We have really good public schools, but they're largely in the suburbs. Do you hear people complain about Wanda High School? It's a good school. Oh, well, yeah, people okay, complain about Wanda, right? But it's generally regarded as a really good public school. Why? It's in the suburbs, right? And let's, a different presentation and all together, how Mount Pleasant used to be nearly all black, all black farmers. Now look at this, it's a really white suburb, really good public school. In 1974, in the Milliken v. Bradley decision, the Supreme Court makes a key decision where they say, you can't bus across district lines in order to desegregate unless de jure segregation exists. So what does that mean? Unless the school district says, we do not allow people of color into our school, we can no longer use busing as a way to desegregate. In other words, in 1974, all these, am I moving or Sorry. In, all the, in 1974, all these suburban schools, so this is after 20, 30 years of white flight, are free from desegregation measures. Because in uh, Matthew Delmont, and, and, and uh, Lassiter, and, and uh, Kevin Cruz, and Joe Crispino, all these guys, talk about this. Unfortunately, mostly white men are talking about this. Not, not just about people of color, not talking about it. But what does it show? That the Supreme Court and their court of law believes in quote unquote de facto segregation, that sometimes segregation is natural. People just choose to be segregated on their own and there's nothing we can do about it. Social scientists and historians have since that is complete nonsense, right? But since the 1970s, we said, well, what are you going to do? People move to the suburbs that they can afford to, and nothing we can do about it. These suburbs have become white armholes that are not required to desegregate. In other words, they're free to perpetuate segregation. 
What does this lead to? This lead to privatization and suburbs. This leads to what we just saw the past couple of weeks. Covington High School, right? Blackface. We see the issue in the Washington Mall. This is not Covington. This is a picture of Port of High School, right? Can you imagine that there's token desegregation? But that's the best you're going to get in these private schools that have been established in the wake of the Brown decision. So privatization and suburbanization are the two major pillars of the reconstruction of public education after the Civil Rights Movement. A third pillar I want to, dis to discuss today is school choice. I'm writing a book on this right now. It's hundreds of pages long. It's hard to describe it in two minutes, but what I'll say is this, is Southern governors and legislators and, and education advocates beginning in the 1950s begin talking about school choice. And their argument is, is this. They say the government and the Supreme Court or a bunch of communists cannot tell me where to go to school. That is in violation of my freedom of association or my freedom of choice. So when the government tells me to get on a bus to go to Sunday to school, or when the government tells me that I have to go to school with someone I don't want to go to school with, they are crossing a constitutional line. Therefore, it is my choice to go to whatever school I want. And it's your choice to go to whatever school you want. And it's your choice. And it's your and it's everybody's choice to go wherever they want. If you want to go to an all-black school, great. If you want to go to an all-white school, great. If you want to go to a quote-unquote mixed school, great. But it's your choice. This also takes on economic implications when Milton Friedman, a uh, Nobel-winning economist, says, well, we can, if we choose where to go to school, this creates a market that improves the entire system. School choice is a reigning education policy today. And if you just look at the rhetoric that some people use around school choice in the 1950s, you can begin to see that they use school choice to talk about avoiding desegregation without talking about race. Very, it, it, it's almost a brilliant mechanism to avoid desegregation. Here's Governor George Timmerman in 1954 and 1955. The parental right to determine what is best for the child is fundamental. It is a divine right. It is our right to choose. Here's a white governor in South Carolina. He's not talking about the benefit of people of color and African Americans. He's not talking about integrating schools. He's talking about preserving the right of white parents where to go to school without children and students of color. Notice the language around choice. It's a divine right. Trust me, I've been to lots of things in Charleston. We still talk like this today. It is my right to send my kid to whatever school I want to. You can't tell me otherwise. We trace this ideology back to the 1950s. Sorry, I put the hater on this together. Fourth and final element of public school reconstruction in the wake of the civil rights movement and in this movement of, of educational justice we see. Policing and fear in the whole country. These are just a few quotes so published in an article in uh, Labor History in the Journal of Education that's looking at the rise of police presence in southern schools. You ever think about when police start, right? Very curious, right? So police never existed in public school. You never, you never thought of it. You might have a knife fight here and it doesn't get a knife fight, right? It was solved in-house. The principal would take care of it, the teachers would take care of it. You might call the police if it's a Friday night football game, but the police were generally not on school campuses. This begins to change, and you really see a change between 1970 and 1972. Why? These are the years that the Supreme Court orders, right, 16 years, 17, 18 years after the Supreme Court decision to desegregate once and for all. So if you go through, it was then news and courier, but the now post and courier, and you go through the headlines, this is what you're going to see in the front pages of the News and Courier during the desegregation. Quote, silent, constant, massive unrest and discontent. <clears throat> Adjustments and changes in the student body, which have brought in a larger portion of blacks to join the race. Whites. 
So you see unrest, you see uncertainty, you see fear, terror among the young people. Parents are afraid for the safety of the children. Boys are beaten, girls are suggested indignities. The idea that these public schools are now inherently violent, vile places because of desegregation. And when you read through the news and courier during this time period, and again this is the early 1970s, you get this idea of mass hysteria that something is wrong with our public schools. And if you look, if this connects to a larger national discourse. Like you ever hear the movie Blackboard Jungle? The idea that these urban cities or these schools are, are decaying and they're falling apart and they're violent spaces and there's violence going on everywhere, right? Connect this to what's happening with desegregation. People are afraid to go to these schools because they're being desegregated for themselves. They're fearful of the unknown. So what do they do? White people in the low country begin to hold these mass meetings and they're all documented at the Charleston County School District archives. Ironically enough, the archives are located right next to a prison. Right out on Leeds Avenue, there's the prison, the detention center, and then there's the archives. Mm. And then the archives, oddly enough, they're talking about what do we do when unrestful, unruly, violent? Well, white parents, and this is all documented in the school board meetings, begin inviting not only local police and all their infinite wisdom, they begin inviting the, um, I'm forgetting the act, the SLEP, what's up, legislative, uh, it's a Southern Law Enforcement Law Enforcement Division. Law Enforcement, what's the S, is it Southern? Southern. Law Enforcement Division, SLEP. It's like the elite troops of police in South Carolina. In 1970, they're less than two years removed from the Orangeburg Massacre, where they killed three African Americans, shot in the back as they were running away, right? Orangeburg Massacre, which is under this anniversary. Mm -hmm. They are inviting SLED to middle schools and high schools. So no wonder we have violent spaces. Mm -hmm. Whites are largely afraid of public schools. We've invited police and SLED to Today we have SLOs in every public school, nearly every public school in South Carolina. And people like Maui Spearman, the state representatives, are asking for more police, more sled presence, armed teachers in school. And on the week we're under, honoring the anniversary of the Stoneman shooting, or the fellow Stoneman shooting, we can see, right, that this is a problem grounded in a longer freedom struggle that this is grounded in the divestment of public education. And we are reconceptualizing the schools of violent spaces in which we're relying upon our school resource officers. Oftentimes, we found in our research with quality education projects, Dr. Kennedy is helping direct this, our research has found that most of these school resource officers in Charleston are retired police officers. So we can see this all history cut this coming back to where our schools are today, which is a divestment of public education, a segregated public education, in a place where most white people see these schools as violent spaces. So if we can go back to this history, we can see that there's a solution. And there is part of a solution right in front of us. And that is teachers regaining control of the classroom, regaining control of the schools. It's called the Red for Edward. And I don't want to raid on anybody's parade, but it is in Charleston and it is right now. What's so frustrating about the Red for Edward yeah. is that 80% of our 82% of our teaching force is white. 87% of the teaching force in South Carolina is white. We do not see this movement connected to a movement that I just spent the past 45 minutes talking to you about. White teachers today are asking for higher salaries, which is great. They're asking for smaller class sizes, which is great. They're asking for more of a tax investment in public education, which is great. But where are the calls for more teachers to call? Within the first five years as the Brown decision, 40,000 black teachers like Willis Sims lost their jobs. Why are they not calling for the end of school resource officers? Why are they not calling for the protection of students of color within our schools? Ultimately, there's a disconnect between the white teacher movement 
in a black history of educational resistance and justice in our schools. So we may have this, but it could very much lead to another instance that we begin to see in, uh, this is a picture of Charlottesville, right? If the current Red for Ed movement is not aware of this larger black history, or if the current educational justice movement is not aware of this larger black educational history for justice, I think we're just perpetuating the same segregation, the same violence, the same ignorance that's defined our school system. I'm not very happy now. Thank you for your time and understanding for taking it. How do we address, given that, as you mentioned, segregation by chance or choice, not de jure, which is by law? So that's a really good question. So first of all, how many of you have ever learned about or discussed de facto segregation even in College of Charles? So first, I made a conscious decision um, was after Walter Scott was shot in North Charleston, and um, after reading, it's a really good book, Matthew Delmont, Why Busing Fails, an excellent book, University of California Press, I check it out. I just stopped teaching the fact of segregation. I wouldn't even teach a distinction. And in fact, in my class, I don't know if you remember, I was like, the fact of the segregation is false. It's all grounded in policy. Or in other words, de jure segregation. So I think one way is to just stop it in the classroom. Like we have to teach people that the fact that the education doesn't, doesn't exist. So it's not just not teaching, but just teaching them to be a false concept that policy is based on. And also I think um, to, to white folks in the room, I think it's having that difficult conversation what we have with our family and friends when they talk about living in the suburbs or places that are being gentrified. Right? So one of my good friends who lives in Boston but moved in the suburbs called Wells, Right? And they have an excellent public school system. He showed me a letter where it's welcoming his kid in the kindergarten, and the superintendent has a PhD in philosophy or something, and it's such a great school system. I said, oh, well, I support public schools. And I spent the next 20 minutes saying, no, you don't. This, this suburban public schools outside of Boston are not public schools. These are essentially, you know, islands of white privilege, right? So I talk about that there's policy and it's just, demystify the idea that segregation is somehow natural, right, or that people choose to be segregated. It's just challenging it everywhere you can. Is that um, My question is, um, I guess you can ask here, is that okay? Um, Over the compost. Um, is there a link to the more increase of school shootings and like segregation within schools? Um, or is there like a reason why it's happening more often now than like ever before? Yeah, so it's a really good question about, you know, the increase in the hearing rights, the uh, increase in school shootings to, to segregation. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I think the Southern Poverty Law Center is, is an amazing resource, a quick resource to, for, to use in the classroom or to talk about with friends and family, things like that. But I should push back and say, you know, school violence or school shootings is a white phenomenon. It's not. The, most of the school shootings we see are in white suburban schools or in schools that have token desegregation. You just go through the list from Columbine, even, even Marjorie Stoneman. You see, like, uh, Miss Gonzalez, I'm forgetting her first name, so, but you know, one of the spokespeople of the movement, right? She may be a person of color, but these are largely white suburban schools. So, school shootings are not a problem in black schools or at next schools. These are problems in white schools. So, it's to see that it's linked to white segregation, it's a white toxicity problem. Obviously connected to a culture of compliance. I think black schools become violent once these students of color step off of the campus. Because if you, if you go through the interviews and testimonies, 
in the city of Chicago, for instance, and Elizabeth Todd Breland just published a really good called The Politics of Education, and it looks at the history of education in the city of Chicago. Students and their families report that they only feel safe in the public schools. They're safe in the schools. They're unsafe once they step up school campuses. I think white schools have this phenomenon where kids are bringing guns to school, a bunch of pills, depression, I just want to see a therapist. Like, things are out of control in white spaces. That's a bit of a generalization, I'm sorry, but I want to take the moment to say that it's racialized, but it's racialized white. Is that how it is? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, so I think your thesis at the end, but here it is, is we need to empower black, more black teachers that the, the labor force. Your experience here in our education school, and now uh, up in Columbia, you can't believe this because this too. Uh, are we doing a good job doing that at the College of Charleston, or is that a reflection of not a diverse student body, or do you see our teacher program here helping that cause, or what can we do better at the college to, to address this? This thesis of yours. Yeah, so we're not doing a good job at the College of Charleston, University of South Carolina, especially Clemson management. We're not doing a good job. We have the right ideas. We have the right, we, we know this research supports, we need those, we need more teachers of color. There's just a report released in the Atlantic, was it the Atlantic that said 2% of all teachers are black men, but they make a difference? Was it the Atlantic? Right? And I think the conversation had at least. So the research is there. Do we have really good programs? It's here it's called the Call Me Mr. program that specifically teaches recruits black men to become teachers. The problem is not that we don't know it. The problem is not investing in those programs. And the problem is the sort of if, if, we're, if we're not educated in the, in the questions of problems of race, a major reaction to SC for ed teachers is, well, someone's going to take my job, and this is reverse discrimination. So I think we're failing at teaching the nuances of affirmative action and race, at the same time that we're not investing in the recruitment of black teachers. Right? So it's, it's an issue of we're afraid of a little bit of pain in order to get to a much better place. And to connect back to school choice, when we see education as a marketplace, Molly Spearman, I just sat on a panel with her, or was at a panel where she was sitting on two weeks ago, and she, just like someone we elected to the office of president, just look the audience and just say, we invest enough in our public schools. It's just poor districts don't know how to spend that money. That's literally what she said. So it, it, it's that type of thinking that we have to root out. A lot of it goes back to the rules that we have. It's the legislation. And when you look at the legislation, like the new uh, education reform bill, they, they're pushing a lot of problematic language that we talked about that we had. It still exists today. They're talking about increasing money for like school therapists, but only in the same breath as increasing money for school research officers. More guns yeah. in the same way as more health. But the problems in our schools and our communities, we can always trace it back to a legislation that is either hostile to this type of knowledge or they perpetuate a system that they were brought up in, which was everything we've laid out today. So like where does where does that conversation begin to take? Yeah, so one it's a really good question how do we sort of influence and the legislature is a major problem, they establish policy. But local school boards are also problems, right? Teachers weren't aware of the school problems too, right? So it's not just the legislature, I think it's, it's I, mean, I don't want to raise that too much, but white people in positions of power who aren't aware of this history are, are part of the problem, right? So then where's the conversation again? I just push back a little bit and say the conversation has been going on since 1865. So it's not that we have to start a new conversation. And if I see one more organization, committed to increasing dialogue and awareness, I'm gonna, I don't know what I'm gonna, like, we talk enough about it, there's enough people aware of that, it's what you do to take that next step, okay? So then it is, it's not forming another organization, it's finding those organizations that already exist, right? So 
if I may plug, Dr. Kendall Dees here is the director of the Quality Education Project. There's a meeting up in North Charleston tonight at 6.30, right? It's a star-studded panel, nine people on it. There's gonna be a big crowd are talking about it, right? So it's finding the people who are doing the work and just showing up and listening and then contributing where you can and the going on. So people are doing the work. So it's probably, it's writing and publishing. It's asking questions to make people feel uncomfortable. It's voting, right? It's you know refusing to do business or to even when you want to and if you go down the path of sending kids where you send your kids. Like there's so much you can do to really address the problem. And something I want to say too that may help. So it's kind of a learning. So in Columbia, I spent this past year learning who's doing what, who are the local organizations, and there's a lot going on. If you just Right. So I think it's fine. knowing that the conversation exists, it's just finding out where it is and then finding out how you can do it. And one thing I'll say too is, um, I always say it, not always say it, but um, I'm a proud father. Edith sits on the hail, she's one year old, right? We start plotting out where she's going to go to school, right? So we live in this neighborhood in Columbia where three people told us not to live. So maybe we don't listen to other white people, but it's what's going on in this neighborhood, beautiful neighborhood. We love it. Why? There's a segregated black school two blocks away, right? It's a Title I elementary school. So of course, we're going to go to that school. And what I'm noticing is I'm serving on the school improvement council. That's my plan now. I mean, I want to. Just by it, and I'm nothing special, trust me. I wish my wife was here to tell you that. Um, we're sitting on the school improvement council, but just by me sitting on that school improvement council and committing my daughter to that school, University of South Carolina is committing resources to that school and putting them in conversation with people at the university. We're publishing things in the local newspaper. So just by showing up and being quiet, or in, in this room right here, being college educated, and picking a school that no one else wants to go to, these are safe places filled with really good people, inspiring people. But you just showing up with the resources you have makes a contribution in voting in certain ways. Does that make sense? So I think it's making it a difference in the situation. Where do you go to school? Go to that school. Help fix that school. Uh, may I also send, um, connect to your question? Um, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm not going to go to school. I'm 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 going to go to school. Um, and these are typically run by the youth after a public education um, session. So that's kind of like having the youth know their particular needs after their political education and then taking the initiative to carry that on themselves. So they, they, the resources that um, folks have, like maybe allies have, um, can come in the form of money to support that. And there's lots of good organizations. I mean, I'm so inspired by students. Uh, Todd's doing really good work. I mean, we have there's such good people at the College of Charleston and in Charleston. Again, just listen to what's happening and, and just the solutions are at the core. It's just getting out of the way. We teach education foundations, and so one of the discussions in foundations is whether the Brown decision was a failure. You know, so you think about issues of desegregation. Um, so I've, I've always wondered what your opinion was on that question. When you think about, we just got finished talking about tobacco segregation. Um, so where do you fall on that discussion? Yeah, so it's a good question. And you really begin to see us revise the, interpret the historical interpretation of Brown 50 years after his commemoration. So in 2004, Derek Bell's publishing, you know, like racial covenants and, you know, uh, the idea that Brown was a failure, right? And I, I don't think my, uh, I'm gonna say research-based opinion is that Brown was not a failure, but the implementation was an utter failure. It was a complete failure. So the decision was great. The, re the decision restores racial justice into a constitution that failed to recognize, right? I mean, it brought racial justice in a clearly outlawed discrimination. 
But the implementation was terrible. You can't just pass a law and expect things to happen. And here I'll draw the comparison to um, President Harry Truman's issue to desegregate the military in 1948. So this is desegregating a bunch of men and sensitive women across the world after having just fought a major world war about to fight the Korean War. Those are difficult circumstances. Do you know how long it took them to desegregate the military peacefully? And think about all these charged, hyper-masculine men with weapons, racist men, a lot of racist men. How long it took them to desegregate? Three years. Three years. No questions asked. The military is one I major issue with the military. Half my family is not major issue. But in terms of racial promotion and justice, it's more evident in the military than it is in any other public institution, I would argue, in the United States. So the decision is great, but the implementation is terrible. The Brown II decision, and then the whole host of decisions up until 1974 make a mockery of that decision. Right? It's what Thurgood Marshall was appointed to the Supreme Court as in 1965 said time and time again that we are failing to enforce the essence of the Browns. So we basically said, well, we shouldn't uh, desegregate, but these white Southerners with Confederate flags are really taken hard and I'm scared. I want their votes. Let's say it's bad, but now we're going to So decision good, but the implementation was terrible. And we had a blueprint about how to do this. We could have desegregated with a little bit of force and integrity holding people accountable to their local schools, we could have done it but failed. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you were familiar with or had any commentary on what the um, Ron, Ron Brown High School, or College Preparatory School in Washington, D.C. What school? Ron Brown College Preparatory School. It's a, it started in 2016 for male students of color, predominantly black male students. Um, they, I don't know if you're familiar with them, yeah. but they have any commentary on it. Yeah, so the prep school in DC is a really good charter school, right? <laughs> and that's so complicated. Um, so, so, so charter schools are part of school choice, which I've been here making school choice. Charter schools largely don't work, but there's a handful that do. Stanford released a report called it's called the Credo Study. It's it's the kind of go-to measurement for educational policy in terms of school choice. In 2017, they released a report that said 23% of charter schools, 23% of the tens of thousands across the country do better than traditional public schools. Okay? So I think some charter schools work, but Americans generally feel that all charter schools are a solution. So I think when you get a good example like some of the KIPP schools up in Harlem or the prep school in DC and you have the Noble College Preps network in Chicago, they perform really well. They're great examples. They're some of the best examples we have public education. But we can't base up an entire system on trying to keep on creating new schools. Because charter schools by theory have to create you have to pay more those schools and we're not spending the money on education itself. So I think you need to take these examples that work, say some charter schools work, and then take these ideas and invest in them in the regular public schools. So I think these schools, and a lot of times they're run by black principals, right? They're racially just places. There's, there's a high school in Chicago called Social Justice High School. It's a charter school. It's amazing. But that's one school in the entire city serving you know, something like 850,000 kids, there's a whole man now. That's 90% African American Latin, like 10 If we allow these charter schools every now and again to do really, really well without fixing the entire system itself, we're doomed for failure. So I think those examples are really good, but we have to be careful to not hold them up as an example for the entire system. Because for every one charter school that's doing well, statistically, there's seven that are doing so why put all our attention on that one that's doing really well, right? Or the two are doing, you know, how do you break that out? Instead of focusing on the one or two, focus on the eight that aren't doing well and ask, how do we take those one or two and put them back in the public schools? I think that's the question we need to ask there. Um, so there's a question about 
Um, would you give kind of that same advice to like Charleston school, school board right now is trying to reevaluate a whole uh, host of measures about how they admit students to their charter schools in the wake of the social diversity study saying that you know it's a mess up system, it's not working, it's enforcing segregation in a way. Um, is that would you give that same advice to the school board right now? Is there thinking about how to revamp their charter school system or what? I try to give it my, my advice. I publish. I don't know how many times I we fight all the time with the school board. Um, so if they would listen, and I would have more patience. Uh, I, so I think um, two things. One is say I to go. You, you said.